Hello and welcome to Beamer Folk. A few weeks ago, our beloved washing machine, a hot point, eventually packed up. It is insured and the engineer that came to service it discovered that the pump had failed. Well, he also realised my interest in electronics and as he left, he presented me with the pump. And so I thought, hmm, pennies from heaven, I wonder what I can do with this. Well, as you can, you can see, I've disassembled the pump. It was very easy to disassemble, built to be recycled, which is a good thing. And, and I thought, well, what can I make of this? The bits that were not of interest to me was this pump here, the little O-ring here, and the rotor itself. This is the rotor and this is the bit that was worn and making a noise. And of course that wasn't of interest to me, the clamp. But the bit that got my attention was this. The um, stator of the motor. You can see two lovely coils here and two terminals. And it looked as though I could dismantle it very easily. So I'll go to the next slide and give you a close-up of this stator. So here it is. You've got two coils effectively in series around this central metal core. You can very easily slide these coils off in this direction from the metal core. It was really easily built to be disassembled. And so I go to the next slide and show you that. When you actually got this core out, I um, cut. This core could actually open up to um, effectively be in series, stacked on top of each other, folding at this point here. So I didn't think I could make much out of both cores together, but I thought individually I could really do something with that. So what I did was cut this plastic, which is very easy to do, down through here and separate these two cores out. It's worth noting that if you ever attempted this, I'm not sure you'd have the same coil assembly as this, but the little connecting wire joining the two coils comes from a center winding on one coil and the outer winding of the other coil. So when you break the wire between the two, it's worth cutting the wire towards the coil that has the windings on the outside, simply because you can easily undo a couple of windings here and re-solder it to create a second terminal here. Whereas if you make the wire short on this coil, because the wire goes to the center winding, you will effectively um, commit this coil to um, non-use. So having a nice length of wire sticking out of this coil here means that you can effectively make use of this second coil if you wish to. So what did I think of doing with one of these coils? Well, I thought of producing a reference frequency. A reference frequency that is derived from an atomic clock, so it would be extraordinarily accurate. The accuracy of a cesium atomic clock is two parts in 10 to the power 12. And I thought I would de derive that accuracy, that accurate frequency, from a transmitter in Cumbria, specifically Anthorn, and it's a 60 kilohertz transmission. And where I live, which is in Devon, I'm sufficiently far away that the signal strength, it should be about 100 microvolts per meter. So that was my idea to effectively turn a 
dysfunctional <laughs> washing machine pump into a highly accurate frequency reference. The frequency, the transmission from Anthorn is called MSF. What does that stand for? Do you know, I couldn't really find out, except for the fact that the prefix M, by all accounts, meets an international standard uh, developed by the International Telecommunications Union, or ITU. But as far as the SF is concerned, I couldn't find any information about that at all. It was probably the initials of the person that developed this in the first place. Perhaps I'm just using my imagination. Or it, what else could it stand for? Science fiction? I don't know. We'll see. Um, I'll move on to the next slide. Uh, I did some work to build the receiver, the 60 kilohertz receiver, on breadboard, on my 1970s breadboard. And I'll move to that slide there. But it was impressive the way that this disassembled very, very easily. I'll move on to the circuit diagram. The amplifier I built for the coil and the coil details I will go into in the next section of this video. The amplifier I built to receive this signal is broken up into two. You've got two sections here. The upper section which um, is remote, and I'll go into the reason why that is so in a second. And the second section here. They are two separate entities. There is a cable between the two, which is this cable here. And my cable has a length of about two meters. The first amplifier, which I called here the preamplifier, is very sensitive. And if you get these two close together, there is a very good chance that you will create oscillations on the output here. So that's the reason why I needed to separate them, because there's a lot of gain going on here. And no matter how you phase the input, um, the op amps here, the op amps here, uh, phase them negative or positive, it will all, it always end up with oscillations. So I pulled them apart. The preamplifier I screened, and I'll show you that later, but the circuit diagram I'll go through now from top left to bottom right. At the top left here, we have a voltage divider. I've, I'm using a 6-volt Lantern battery at the preamplifier head, and I'm splitting that into, as you see here, with um, a capacitor down to the minus 3 here. You've got two 10Ks here, which effectively split. You've got a decoupler, a supply decoupling capacitor here. So that's fairly understandable. The center tap here, for want of a better description, is naught volts and you effectively go plus three and minus three and that drives the op amps. Right, moving on to the input section here. With the adapted coil, I had to take windings off the coil to get the correct inductance to create a tuned circuit, a resonant circuit, a tuned to 60 kilohertz. The 60 kilohertz is very critical and you've got here a parallel capacitor to the coil that acts as the uh, tuned circuit and subject to the wiring to the coil and the input capacitance to the op amp, yours might vary slightly. Um, this is adjusted to get peak resonance at 60 kilohertz. There's also, you notice the small puffage here, it's 22 puff, very small. And you've got a couple of diodes here. They are protection diodes. If magnetism passes the coil in any sense of the word, any strong sense in the word, you could develop quite a bit of EMF driving into this op amp. So I kind of protected it by using these two um, back-to-back -back 
diodes in parallel, D1 and D2. But watch out for the puffage here. Each diode puts about two puff onto this 22. So um, that adds to the capacitance. And if you use different diodes here, they would probably represent different uh, capacitance, which will affect the resonance of the um, LC here. So moving on to the um, anything else to be said there. Yes, the voltage on the input never exceeds the forward voltage of these diodes, which is about 0.7 of a volt DC. And so plus or minus. So so the the EMF being generated on here will never exceed uh, plus or minus 0.7 of a volt. And in fact, diodes providing you keep uh, lower than the forward voltage can act as extraordinarily good high resistances. And when I mean high resistance, I mean in the giga giga ohms. So if you want an inexpensive high resistance that you keep the voltage below the forward voltage of a diode, um, this could be for you. Anyway, moving on to the first op amp. The first op amp is a um, positive input um, amplifier with the gain being described by R4 divided by R3. And the, the gain of this is set to uh, approximately the maximum that this IC, the TLC272, will accommodate in its bandwidth. And it should be around 70. If you try and push this op amp more than the gain of 70, maybe 80, 90 or 100, you'll bump up against the maximum bandwidth of the um, internally compensated um, compensation of this op amp. So that output drives this circuit here. And this is a tuned circuit. It's called a Salon Key HP, that's high pass filter. There isn't much gain to be had in here. And in fact, I've squeezed the max maximum amount of gain possible out of this op amp for the job that it is doing. But it rolls very sharply below uh, 60 kilohertz because I don't really want to receive anything below 60 kilohertz but I do want to receive 60 kilohertz and I don't want to receive much beyond 60 kilohertz well I'm relying on the um, internal compensation of both of these op amps to shut down beyond 60 kilohertz so as you approach say 61 kilohertz these op amps will be clamping down the gain anyway. So you end up with a tuned circuit. You've got a capacitor on the output of this that drives the cable to the next amplifier section. That capacitor here, C8, is carefully chosen to again act as a high pass filter. And it connects with R11 here. So anything below 60 kilohertz will be, again, additionally cut down. So we're building a very steep um, slope either side of 60 kilohertz here. So that brings me on. Incidentally, the output voltage here is about 80 millivolts peak to peak, um, which is, of course, 28 millivolts RMS at 60 kilohertz and that's being squirted out via this cable into this section here. I've got a second uh, separate power supply, six volt lantern battery with an exactly identical splitter to this one here driving the amplifier board. The amplifier board can sit on my bench in front of um, screens and other switching devices without it affecting the output here. Whereas this section here, the preamp, you must never get near any other electronic item. In fact, actually what interferes with this 60 kilohertz is a great deal. 
you um, you can't have, for example, uh, compact fluorescent tube lamps in the room. They emit frequencies that this will pick up and any other form of um, switching equipment, um, like, for example, a power supply to a laptop, you need to disconnect the mains from that because even though the laptop is not switched on, the actual power supply is still switching slightly. So it, this, this section here needs to be put into a position that is in the room, that is as quiet electromagnetically as possible. It's a very sensitive little creature, this. Now, the amplifier is straightforward here. You've got her, um, an inverter amplifier here with the gain set between R12 and R11, 100k to 5.6k. Again, I'm bumping up against the maximum gain possible for this op amp. And that goes into a non-inverting amplifier here, which is the positive terminal here. And again, uh, you've got the maximum gain here possible. I've put a small capacitor here across the output, and that is tuned to using the 1 over 2 pi RC. That's rolling off any frequencies that may have been introduced by the wire itself. This is incidentally a screened cable, not a twisted pair. The, there is a twisted pair, incidentally, going to the coil coming into here, but I've used a screen cable to connect the two amplifiers. That can generate a bit of noise on the line, a bit of noise here, so I put this capacitor here just to uh, squash down any high frequencies above 60 kilohertz. And then you've got an output here, and the output is now quite high. It's at 0 0.707 um, RMS, which is what, 1 volt peak, or 2 volts peak to peak, at 60 kilohertz. And that's the circuit diagram. It took a little while to construct and tune, because this is a receiver, a TRF receiver. And there we are. I would like to add that Wikipedia do an excellent page on MSF transmissions, and I'll include a link in the description below for that. There are, if you search Wikipedia, there are other transmissions from other countries around the world, but MSF is the one from Cumbria, and that's the one that I'm tuning into. The You can see how the coil has been separated out here. It's very easy to do, and you can see the specifications for both coils that I'll include here. Uh, air cord inductors are thought to be better than ferrite cord inductors. The advantage of ferrite, of course, you don't have to do many turns to get the inductance, but they do have a problem with uh, thermal change. The two coils here, I've got one adapted or tuned to my project and the other one kept as the original construction. So I'll remove that one because that is not applicable here. So we're left with this one here. I had to remove quite a few turns on this coil. In fact, I'll show you the amount. Uh, it was about 500 turns, quite a bit. And that is the wire that I removed from it. Right, well what I'll do is I'll show you how I actually constructed the coil. I'll bring it to the camera, hopefully keeping in focus. So that's okay. What I managed to do was bend over the one single tag with a wire attached to it here. I created a very small printed circuit board, strip board, and soldered it on the underside of that tag, creating a second land, which is here, and soldered the other wire of the coil onto that land, and then soldered two wires, the black and the yellow, onto um, that board, strip board, 
and then retain that wire via a, um, a cable clamp. The wire length there is about four inches and as you can see it formed quite a nice coil. I thought I'd mention that the very thin, what was it, quarter of a millimeter wire, very delicate, but not the thinnest I've ever handled, is um, easily soldered. You don't have to strip the enamel or the coating back in any way. You just have to place it effectively on the land that you want to solder it to and solder it. The coating comes off with the temperature of the soldering iron. The other thing I'd like to mention is that this is actually tuned to the MSF 60 kilohertz. And what I mean by that is that because there is interwinding capacitance, you've effectively got in this coil the um, L and the C components of the resonant formula, which is the 2 pi LC. 1 over 2 pi LC. And so uh, you don't really, so when you when you test this it will, the first resonance that will occur, the first peak that will, will occur is on this coil now tuned to exactly 60 kilohertz. I only need a very small amount of capacitance to bring it exactly into line with 60 kilohertz and I think that capacitance for this coil is 22 puff. Before continuing to an actual physical build of this amplifier assembly, this receiver, I thought I would just do uh, a simulation. This is the Falsted online simulator stimulator. So I thought I would just go through the two amplifier blocks and see that everything is um, tickety-boo. We have here the amplifier section. This is actually the output amplifier unit that can sit on your bench that um, can be near other appliances that are operating. And we have here the two op amps. These are in the simulator two ideal op amps. Their bandwidth can go easily up to 10 megahertz so it's not exactly the TLC 272 as described in the circuit diagram. I've adjusted the gain very slightly. Uh, I've adjusted these two resistors. There was too much gain so the values of these have changed to the circuit diagram slightly. The two gain elements within this amplifier, well the first one here is a gain of 12.1 is an inverting amplifier and the gain of the second unit is a gain of 4 because it is a non-inverting amplifier and those two resistors here describe a gain of 3 and it's 3 plus 1 which equals 4. There is as described in the circuit diagram this high pass filter component here and if you multiply the gain of this one by the gain of that one, you come to 4 times 12, which is 48.4. It's not the... And if you look at... If you, if you divide the output here by the input, the output is this wave here at uh, nearly 0 0.707 of a volt. It's actually 709 millivolts. If you divide that by the input which is here which is nearly 28 millivolts you end up with a realistic gain of 25.5 well that is very different to the product of these two gains at 48 and why is why is there a loss here uh, and it's simply because there are a couple of reactive components in here. You've got this capacitor here and you've got this capacitor here and that is causing a 
overall loss in gain. I'll just stack up these waves and we can see whether we are getting any phase difference between input and output. So let me go to scopes and put on stack all. Well, the output wave is this one here and the input wave is that one there. I'll now slow down the simulation speed so we can get a good look. So the output here is, as far as I can see, absolutely 180 degrees out of phase to the input. Well, that's, that's good. There seems to be a slight difference in phase between the input and the first stage. You can see there's a slight shift here, and that is a, a phase lead. It's a capacitive phase lead to the output of that section. But by the time it goes through the second section, which is the output here to the input, there is a very slight phase shift. And these phase shifts can become important because if it gets too severe, you can get self-oscillation in amplifiers. So, but this circuit is very simple and, um, and there shouldn't be a problem with it. Okay, well, this is that's the output, and as you can see, I've got it adjusted to the circuit diagram of 0 0.709, well, that's very close to 0 0.707, and an input of uh, 28 millivolts. So um, that's working in accordance to the circuit diagram. Well, this is the enclosed uh, remote preamplifier, 60 kilohertz. You can see it's a slightly more complicated diagram. We start off with here on the left hand side. This is a 60 kilohertz source. Well, in reality, it is the coil. And as the coil, of course, is virtually a few ohms, the bias to the op amp is derived through the coil. So the coil has to be connected. The first amplifier op amp gain is 68k divided by 4.7 which comes out at 14.47 well it's a non-inverting amplifier configuration so you can add a 1 to that becoming 15.47 we then go into this salon salon key filter section this is a high pass filter section and i've determined the gain to be a gain of 13 well, if you multiply, I'll get my calculator out. If you multiply those two gains of 13 multiplied by 15.47, you come out with an overall gain theoretical of 201. But very similar to the other amplifier block section, it's very different to the realistic gain. And here is the realistic gain here of 142 and the gain that is simply because there are reactive elements within the circuit right let's have a look at the phase relationship on the scoping so let's put that down stack here we are and i'll drop the simulation speed down in theory when you look at this considering it's got quite a high gain of 142. This is a non-inverting amplifier, and so is this a non-inverting amplifier, which would mean that the output would be in exactly the same phase as the input. And as the input is a coil, and there's a lot of gain here, you would expect this to self-oscillate. And in fact, it doesn't. And it doesn't because... The output, which is this wave here, compared to the input, which is that wave there, is actually about 90 degrees out of phase. And of course, these capacitive components here are shifting the phase and the output being out of phase to a quite significant degree means that it doesn't automatically go into oscillation. 
but it has the potential to go into oscillation, which is the reason why it needs to be enclosed. And uh, that's that. All I need to do now is get this working and on the bench. Oh, there are a couple of points that I wanted to add. One is we were talking about phase shift there, but bear in mind that these are ideal op amps. In the real world, um, op amps like the TLC272, if you get close to the upper bandwidth, it can exhibit a phase shift due to internal compensation. But as all four of these op amps in this receiver are set at gains that are modest, it's in an area where phase shift is not exhibited. Secondly, I thought we would do a, a bandwidth, a lower bandwidth check uh, for this input amplifier. Uh, at 60 kilohertz, we know that it was at 28 millivolts. So if I take 28 and divide it by, and I've adjusted the frequency here. Yeah, actually, that's better to, to about 30 kilohertz, which is one octave below. I can't do one octave above because, again, these are ideal op amps. And un unlike the TLC272, uh, they will keep on climbing up. These will keep on climbing up to 10 megahertz. So anyway, we're at 30 kilohertz, which is one octave below. And the output now is 2.4, let's say 9. And that equals 11.24. Now let's find the log of that which is 1.05 and multiply it by 20 because we're dealing with volts here and if we were dealing with power it would be 10 and that would equal 21. So I'm getting a 21 dB slope per octave on the lower end, the lower bandwidth, which is actually pretty, pretty steep. I hope that's good enough for this receiver. It might not be. Before us are the fruits of my effort. We'll just go through what they are. Lantern battery, coil of interconnecting screen wire, about two meters, pre-amplifier circuit, main amplifier circuit, and all important coil. I'd like to add that I've got links to two Wikipedia pages in the description below. One is for the an MSF and the other one is for Salon Key filtering. I'll also include a link to a Salon Key um, high-pass calculator as well. Yeah, a couple of things to be said. One is that I've included across the op amps a decoupling capacitor of 10 microfarad on both of these op amps. It's not shown in my circuit diagram, but it's always good to get a close decoupling as close as possible to op amps. And um, finally here, the enclosure for screening of the preamplifier, well, this is it. A well-known soup can, obviously very well cleaned out, and there's a drill hole at this end, which the twisted wire of the coil goes through. As you probably gathered by now, MSF is actually the transmission to calibrate radio clocks but I'm not so interested in the clock coding of this carrier wave I'm much more interested in the carrier wave itself the reason being is that the clocks by the time it's decoded is only accurate to 0.01 percent whereas the carrier wave being derived from atomic clock is, and wait for this, 
zero point zero 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 two percent accuracy and that is the reason why I'm interested in the carrier. There is a problem with the carrier and that is that it is modulated by the coding and its amplitude modulated. The other reason is that I can't do this setup during the night this is actually recorded during the daytime simply because there are so many people around me in different rooms etc that have switch mode adapters you know, wall warts plugged into the mains and uh, LED lights and compact fluorescent lights and flat screen television all of which interferes with this 60 kilohertz transmission it is a bit of a nightmare and I have got up my sleeve one or two ways in which I can improve this but this particular test that we're going to do now is just the bandwidth test and what I've got is an oscillator uh, with its output just loosely placed in the room with a transmission of 59.80 kilohertz and what you're looking at here is the tuning of the receiver so I've got the preamplifier in the middle of the room and I've got the amplifier actually on my bench and I'm putting the scope on the output of the amplifier and I'm adjusting the oscillator which is built into the oscilloscope to peak the tuning and to see where where it peaks right well I'm gonna peak this and just check the tuning of the receiver uh, the, the oscillator is built into the oscilloscope so if I adjust this you can see how peaky that is how sharp that is from either side of the desired frequency of 60 kilohertz and that's about peak and you can see it's just slightly over 60 kilohertz um, I'm going to check the bandwidth now and I'm looking at the peak to peak voltage here and it looks to be about let me adjust it so I can read it it's at one volt per centimeter so it's one two three about 3.8 now I'll bring in my 1970s let's switch it on 1970s programmable calculator Casio calculator that if you switch it off all the programming disappears it has no memory so let's put in um, let's put in 3.8 divided by and let's now move the frequency down one octave to 30 kilohertz that's half the frequency that's about it isn't it my goodness it's disappeared isn't it so let me increase this and see what we've got it looks as though we've got um, 0 0.2, uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, about point, move that down one more notch there, see if that helps. Okay, what have I got here? I've got 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.35 volts, three, peak to peak. So if I divide that by that, which is 0.35, it equals, it equals, I don't know if you can see that there, 10.857. Now get the log of that, which is that. And as it's volts, we multiply by 20, and that equals that so we're getting about 21 db per octave um, for those that don't know octave is derived from a musical notion that is eight white notes between octaves now what i go up to now is an octave high and octave so it's doubling the frequency to um, 120 kilohertz 120 kilohertz you, there is a, 
a high frequency filter of I think 6 dB per octave in my design but of course at 120 we're bumping up against the bandwidth of the op amps very clearly so that should be behaving as a filter so what have we got there oh goodness gracious you know the, this setup is not accurate by any means it's um, fair, it's 0.1 so we've got 0 0.2, 0 0.18, 0 0.18. So if I go 3.8 divided by, what did I say about 0 0.2, 0 0.18, that equals, that equals that. Find the log of that, and it comes out at that, multiplied by 20 because we're dealing with volts and that comes out at well all right 26 db so there we are we've got 20 db down on the lower frequency and um, 26 db on the higher frequency it is reasonably sharp but is it sharp enough i'm still not quite sure but if it doesn't quite work as well as I would like, um, there are things up my sleeve that I can do. OK, that's the bandwidth check. Now we'll actually see the, um, the received transmission. OK, with the coil in the centre of my room aligned north so that it should pick up the maximum signal, from Anthorn, you can see um, the received signal. I haven't connected the counter to it for one simple reason, and that is its instability with my fairly primitive setup, inexpensive counter, is not capable of counting this frequency. But I can do it on the scope. The scope is reasonably accurate, and you can see you've got more or less a shaky sine wave but what we do is the time base is sent, set to what is it 10 microseconds and we have here from the left hand side at the very peak we've got one two three before it hits, hits a peak on the graticule again now that is 10 because this is set the time base is set to 10 microseconds so that's 10 20 30 40 50 microseconds if i now go 50 microsecond exponent 6 minus divided by we said three cycles in that time that comes out at 1.666 times 10 to the minus 5 get the reciprocal of that to get the frequency and we come out with I don't know whether you can see this there we go which is put it into engineering mode I've gone back to my LCD calculator again Casio I like Casio always had Casio um, there we are 60k absolutely spot on now, why can't the why doesn't the counter pick this up? And I'll show you. <coughs> Bearing in mind, this is the quietest time. It's midday here. It's the quietest time electromagnetically in this building. But now, if I move the time base so that you can see the problem, and that is the issue. And I don't know because the camera is um, the camera is uh, probably interfering with the wave that's being seen slightly, but it is a modulated mess. The building that I'm in could be um, could have a lot of metal in it. Um, I might need to take this out to the garden to um, do this properly but uh, certainly uh, it's the end of um, this particular recording I think it's getting a bit extended and I'll move on to 
part two of this and I'll see if I can refine this a bit better, get a nice solid signal out. The transmission is amplitude modulated but it's not completely annihilated so I think it works between 10 or 20 percent to 90 percent so with a little bit of um, innovation I'm sure I'll be able to generate some form of wonderful reference signal from an atomic clock at 60 kilohertz but that'll be left to part two so stay tuned this is Beamer signing out for now.